Do editors help you? Edgar? Do editors? Editors. No, because... Uh, well, no, I would say that, yes. Because I just thought of a, of a story recently where an editor made a suggestion for ending the story a little differently. And as soon as the suggestion was made, I saw, yes, of course, this is extremely sensible. I changed the story, and the story was improved. I was about to say that, in general, I, I don't have too much contact with editors anymore. It's uh, Generally, I saw the thing goes in, and it's sold. But uh, then, as soon as I was about to say that, I thought of this other incident. And, uh, well, I think any... Uh, Any time a person is a professional and is reading, a, uh, it's their business to judge manuscripts. They see something wrong with it. Their opinion ought to be respected. Just if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, you got a sore foot, you better believe it. I understand that you just about have to have some kind of a base in New York uh, without going into detail. Is your agent in agent New York? In New York, yeah. Mm-hmm. What about other writers? I have, uh, well, some of my best friends are writers. I wouldn't want my daughter to marry one, but... (laughs) (laughs) But you've never been a part of that whole Milford uh, scene, et cetera. I I don't mean that specifically. I mean the idea of shop talk at a convention and so forth. No. Now, this bores me. Uh, It's a... It seems an artificial charity kind of situation where uh, it leaves me utterly cold, so I avoid these things like the play. So it's you and your typewriter and your mind and you know, I'm whatever I'm comes out and my whatever own happens after that may or may not have anything exactly. to do with it. Do you have a large family? Yeah, oh, just one boy. Mm-hmm. Did you have any problems when he was uh, that noisy age? Yeah. What trying you to do your writing. Was that <laughs> <laughs> well, I assume he's more than two and a half or so now. Fifteen. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the thing is, when he wants to do his homework, he gets into my favorite chair, where I'm anxious to get there and possibly knock out a word or two. But in as much as uh, he has perfect, he has a right to be there. And he's part of as I, I just kind of wander around behind him and look at him a couple of times and go someplace else. Then he's probably got some music on the radio, which I don't like very much. But, uh, no, actually, he and I get along very nicely to me. We were talking earlier about what ifs. Mm-hmm. You ever done a what if as to uh, had you not become a writer? Well, uh, gee, I don't know. I've, uh, I can't think of anything right now that I particularly have toyed with many other occupations, but uh, I think I probably rather early decided I want to be a writer and just became a writer. I was I was originally going to be a scientist, mathematician. That was when I was quite young. Are you a fan of Martin Gardner's? Well, yes and no. I, I, well, uh, I, I don't like the man personally. Somehow, I don't like his his philosophical bent or his mm-hmm. philosophical attitude. He annoys me. I think he's smug. Uh, he he has a closed mind. Although he pretends as if he's the most open-minded son of a gun in the world. Campbell is an open-minded man. Martin Gardner's got a closed mind. Although Martin Gardner's a much more voluble, clever man than Campbell. Mm-hmm. Campbell would uh, was a much deeper man than Gardner could ever pretend to be, uh, and probably more honest. I, Gardner is uh, well. I don't know him personally, but he it irritates me to read him because mm-hmm. uh, he puts forward his opinions as if they're mm-hmm. solid fact. And he ridicules ideas which uh, were just on the basis of his prejudices, which annoys me. Uh, There's uh, 
certain certain uh, things going on in the world which I think deserve investigation rather than ridicule. Essentially, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, parapsychology. Uh, mm -hmm. Gardner's a fool of parapsychology and parapsychological research. Now, I have uh, personally haven't had any events occur to me which I could put my finger on exactly. But uh, it certainly seems to me that uh, if he, Gardner, wants to consider himself a scientist, he should have an open mind and be willing to judge uh, events or reports of events on their own merits rather than his personal prejudices, which is my basic annoyance with Martin Gardner yeah. and Isaac Asimov as well. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> they do have a lot of uh, similar ideas. They're dogmatic. Mm -hmm. Well, well satisfied with themselves, I suppose we all get that way. Well, it, it puzzles me really, but uh, I can understand Gardner. He's he's got a, a white collar job with a New York magazine. Uh, it's a, a kind of a trendy, kind of a faddish kind of a job. Asimov ought to know better. Asimov, who has lived in the surroundings of science fiction, so to speak, speculation, and he's known Campbell very well. Of course, maybe this would start in Campbell probably was infuriatingly dogmatic in other respects, maybe. I, I don't know Campbell that well. I shouldn't even say that. But perhaps Asimov adopted his dogmatism as a uh, reflection or a mirror against Campbell. Maybe uh, Campbell drove him to his dogmatic uh, concepts, but uh, anyway, both these two chaps, I think, ought to ought to know better. Uh, they they view the world as if the basic notions are cut and dried; that they or the traditional scientists have everything under control, which I find is far from the truth. It may just be that they they're living past the era when science was relatively stable into an, another era mm -hmm. of change and they are unable to adapt to it. Well, it's, uh, I, personally, I don't know. I, I haven't any, uh, I've got lots of theories, true, but uh, <laughs> who hasn't? Yeah. We are about out of time. Jack, Dance, thank you for coming down and, and uh, doing well, our Well, it's been a great pleasure. It wasn't uh, what you thought it was going to be, was it? How do you know what I thought it was going to be? I don't have any idea what you thought it was going to be. Who's <laughs> <laughs> well, willing to bet it wasn't? <laughs> But if you well, had any experience with the media... I just came out here utterly blank. You know, okay. that, was from her <laughs> being that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jack Vance, of course, will be at Change of Hobbit tomorrow afternoon. What and, times? Between 1 o'clock? Between 2 o'clock and 5. Yeah, and, 2 uh, o'clock and 5. The store's a little bit larger than the studio, so... Yeah. And a little cooler. Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends. It depends on how many people show up. You get oh, that yeah, both air conditioners working this way. Yeah, and the fish tank. Come back whenever you're in town because we'll all still be here on Friday night. Very good. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you. And uh, once again, thank you very much. You're welcome. And keep working, please. I will. <laughs> okay, next week, uh, mostly the show is on tape. We're going to try again to bring you the that 90-minute uh, interview with Ray Bradbury that we wanted to give you last what week. What about the Bride of Esp? The Bride of Esp we will also put on, but not next week. That'll be oh, okay. another week okay. or two. Some more. And uh, until then... Keep listening, as they say, and uh, stay this tuned. This is Mitchell Harding. And I'm Mike Hodel. And coming up, Paul Vangelisti and Goodbye Park Pie Hat. And maybe he will even, in his new time slot, explain the title of the program. He even left him a piece of cake. Good night. It's a minute before midnight. This is KPFK in Los Angeles. And if you're tuning in for Tesseract, Tesseract is now heard on Saturday night following Zimmergy starting at 10 o'clock in the evening and running till midnight.